I'm a little worried since this is my first time speaking to a room full of testers, and I'm wondering how many of you use Git and GitHub as part of your work workflow. Cool, a fair number. So I put a couple of extra slides that is like, this ha is how Git works, and we'll, we'll uh, cruise through those a little, a little more quickly. Um, and I'm wondering how many of you have tried documenting, you know, work with documentation as part of your testing process, and have tried, you know, different ways of documenting things. And I'll show you a couple of examples of what I've seen devs do. Anybody, I like chatting with the audience. Does anybody want to tell me about their really cool documentation thing they did? No hands there? Yes. Team, we actually started using GitHub for our documentation, our, it's our internal documentation, because we found it just got too disorganized on a wiki. Mm -hmm. And with GitHub, we were already all used to using it, and we could organize it really well. The search works really well in GitHub, and it just seemed more compatible with, for a team of developers. So that was a successful experiment. I will say I've also used uh, GitHub to publish to Gitbook uh, to publish documentation, which is kind of nice. Gitbook. Gitbook. I haven't heard of Gitbook either, so I'll have to take a look. Yep. Um, you know, the, the hotel is really excited to have me here, and it wants to make sure I'm on their Wi-Fi. So we're just going to keep keep closing that out, because that's not what we need to do right now. Um, so I've seen documentation get spiced up in a couple of different ways. One of my favorites has been, um, you know, some folks will actually use uh, ASCII art as a way of showing state within their documentation, kind of a, like, you are here within a program. If you know there's like a process that needs to happen and you want to visualize and say, yes, I am there. Um, and this person has the lovely idea of creating a Tumblr just to like glorify this, this type of documentation. I love it. Um, and if you are as taken with this as I am, you can go down to that nice little art generator there. And instead of like typing out all those little, you know, ASCII do 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 things, you can, uh, you know, do a hand-drawn sketch, and then poof, it becomes ASCII art and is wonderful and can be easily added to your documentation. Other folks say, you know what? I never want to leave my terminal. I love my terminal. I'm not going to interrupt my flow at all. I am going to make myself my own man pages to document different parts of my process. And to them, like, hooray. I will never look at their man page, but I know I'm glad it exists for them. Um, and one thing that I've run into is, you know, we can look at the at the various, you know, attempts and um, and like different ways that people look at projects and problems, and we can say like, hooray, let's go off and make a man page for this or whatever the idea is. Or we can kind of, you know, stamp it out. So when we're, so especially when we're working with junior de developers and junior testers and folks who are bringing a new, like, perspective, um, that's one thing to remember. Um, so I'm wondering, in testing, and this is something I do not know. So you know, we can. I'm hoping, like, we have some chat over Q and A. Um, is there, you know, more or less emphasis in problem solving? Because I know. You're trying to find all the things that could go wrong. Um, and I think developers are often trying to make a thing that works. Um, so kind of going down the center of path as, as opposed to like, you know, trying to knock over all the pillars on the side of the road. Do you guys use that analogy? Maybe you don't want to think of being a car hitting pillars on the side of a road. Um, yes. We, we, have, we have one commenter that says they try going down the center of the road, but end up hitting the pillars anyway. Um, that's actually the kind of developer I am as well, so you're in good company. Um, yes?
okay, we have an experience where someone had their work uh, saved locally and they were happily cruising along doing everything right locally and then, you know, the terrible thing happened. And, and here we are with, uh, I, I, I've had a hard cry, drive crash um, when I was in academia that, that brought a whole team to tears as well. And um, it turns out that we weren't using the cloud, especially in government positions like, you know, 10 years ago. And it turns out we really wish we had been on that particular day. So um, it does happen. And, you know, going, going back to what the value of the wrong way, um, I, I've run into a lot of really well-meaning folks that told me, you know, you're getting started as a developer. And if you want to survive as a dev, you're going to have to focus, get narrow, and do the right thing. Move as fast towards it as you can. Um, and that, you know, is, is a pretty difficult thing to hear as you're learning and as you're bumping into all those pillars along the way, because that is part of, um, part of the process. And of course, the corollary of that um, I, it took me a long time to realize that the folks who were telling me to get as quickly towards my goal as possible were absolutely right. Um, but settle, settling on a path and just like cruising as quickly as you can towards it um, isn't sustainable. And you know, as, as a human as well as a developer, it means you only have one way, of, you're left with only one way of coping. And that is this like, you know, if I'm not moving forward, things aren't okay feeling. Um, and you can't really enjoy learning if you're too scared of being wrong. Um, so I'm one of those folks who needs room to mess up. And today I'm going to celebrate one of my mess ups um, and talk about a time when doing things the wrong way ended up teaching me a lot how to use uh, Git more thoroughly than I had in the past and um, explore ways of making new tools and ended up creating my, my, um, my own. So, boop. I see a lot of you all are familiar with Git, so I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. This is the simplest Git tree I could find on the internet. You have a master branch where your code lives happily, and then you're off making a feature, so you, um, so you, you know, branch off and you say, you know, this feature is going to add this, and the, the code will continue as other people work on it, and then you're going to put your uh, contributions back in. Um, so that is, that is the, the kind of flow that we're used to in a very small project. If it's just me and two other people, this is what it ends up looking like. If it's me and a whole bunch of people at work, we end up starting to get, you know, this, this kind of piece. Now the real, the real magic of Git, the thing that's really powerful, um, is that we can go back in time. And this, this time travel means that, you know, if you have that one coworker that always breaks everything, there's still a tomorrow for all of us. Because we just, you know, get in our, we put on our little Time Lord hats, if that's what Time Lords wear, and we, we go back to the commit uh, the place and time where everything was okay and we start from there. Now, the difficulty with being Veronica at the time that I started this project was I was really scared of that back in time part. And I was also learning um, what I needed to do to, you know, do web development and, you know, trying to figure out uh, Git and like all these different pieces all at once. So I was relying on commit messages to, to tell me when I needed to go, where I needed to go back to, and that works out great, um, except that sometimes, um, you know, if you rely on commit messages and you do it wrong and you find yourself in the wrong place, you can end up in this terrible loop where you're like, shoot, I'm in the wrong spot. Well, let's look at the commit messages again. And then you guess again and you go, oh shoot, I'm in the wrong spot. And suddenly you're like all out of your flow and you know everything, all the thoughts you had before you got started are going stale and things are, are it's, a, it's a pretty terrible feeling. Um, and the difficulty with Git 
is, you know, I said that I like being able to mess up. And Git is perfect for that because Git allows us a myriad of ways that we can screw everything up. And a lot of people approach Git like this, you know, what is Git? Well, we just memorize these commands and we do them in this order and like, oh shoot, I don't exactly know what's happening, but like, let's just keep pushing. It'll be fine. Um, and that, that's a pretty okay spot to be uh, most of the time. Um, and when I was first learning how to use Git, that is exactly how I used it. I went to a friend and I said, you know, just tell me how this should work. I'm too overwhelmed and I don't know how to do anything. And they very nicely taught me the five commands I needed to know. Um, push, pull, I can't remember the other three right now. You can already see where this was going. Um, and finally, you know, I would write that person messages, you know, 14 times a day and say, hey, I'm stuck here, how do I do? And, you know, finally they said, go make yourself a Google Doc, you're being ridiculous. And so I would slowly add to this Google Doc, and that was like my, my Git crutch. Um, but I never did a Git intensive. So that kind of gives you an idea of where I was when I was starting to approach this problem. I had started with five commands, and that's about what we could do in Git. So I would make the changes locally. Um, I would commit, I would push as soon as possible because I was chasing the feeling of seeing my changes on the GUI and being like, yes, I actually am writing code and making a thing. Um, and, but I did make a list of what a more thorough flow in Git might include um, to give you an idea of kind of like, you know, Veronica knows five commits. There are at least 75 more that she could or should be learning. So if you imagine, I, I, I scribbled out this, my own Git tree, so I'm only going forward in time. So I'll like pull up a branch, I'll make a change, I'll put it back down, just me hanging out. So I can, I can ride this wave of like happy git use. And this is me out there on the beach, you know, riding my little git wave and I'm having a good time and things are fine until I mess something up. And I become that person who makes those commits that don't make any sense and I just gotta go back and rework the whole thing. And you can, you know, if anything gets messy out on the waves, what happens? I, I, break, my, I break my board, it's, you know, things, things are a big mess. Um, and so, I started to do So, you remember that I'm using commit messages. Yes, I can. Uh, oh, I got you, I got you. I understand, that's probably the most photographable slide in this whole deck, so maybe we'll answer questions on this slide. It'll be good. Um, not a problem, I got you. So, remember that I was using my commit messages to tell me where in time to go back to, and I didn't have, you know, I only have so much energy for this whole time travel thing. I'm a new time lord, I'm tired, it's, I'm trying to learn 12 other things at one time. Um, and when I, when I give this talk to developers, the whole room is erupting in laughter by now, because you can imagine 14 hours ago, you might have written a very reasonable commit message that says, the code that I just sent up to the cloud is doing this, right? That's, that's a pretty reasonable commit message. But by the time it's like 12 hours later, you're just writing, you're just pounding your hands on the computer because you want to be done with that step and to move on to the next one. Um, so that, you know, we, and we all get to that point, like when we're doing something that's difficult, when it's frustrating, when it's hour 14, you know, self-care, don't code for 14 hours, but like when it's hour 14, because we all in inevitably do, um, that's where, that's where we end up. Um, so I did, so I decided that since I was relying on these commit messages, I was going to be an intensely good commit message writer. And I said, well, if this is what I'm relying on, I can't go into that terrible place where, you know, it's me with the broken surfboard and I'm crying in a puddle of water. Um, so I went online and I said, okay, what are some things commit messages should have? And, you know, you need to avoid abbreviations. You want to summarize 
what you've done and then why within your commit message. Um, and the goal is to make your Git log useful, like something people can come back to um, and not, not this. Um, because if you tried to find anything after about the halfway point in here, you would be in a terrible place. So this is, this is the bad place. We try not to do this, but we all end up here anyway. Um, so I wanted to do a little exercise with us, and I wanted to say, what, what messages, whether you're used to using Git or not, like what commit messages would you make to give yourself, to give yourself a visual picture of the changes that we've made here on this slide? So we have, have two changes. Um, if anybody wants to shout out what they are, I'll feel good that you all are like with me in my, in my painful. The color and the underline are different. Um, so so what, could we, what could we say to, you know, we're tired, we're trying to remember what we changed. You know, what would we say in that commit message? What? Updated nav colors, that would be nice. And then what would we do about the underline? You updated nav colors and added underline? I wonder if maybe I was playing around with the colors and I had changed the colors like 14 times on my site because I'm a new developer and I don't really understand design and I don't know what looks good together. And maybe, maybe I've done that. <laughs> so, so, just, so just like I did, um, I ended up getting more and more verbose. So I would say I started with, you know, change, um, you know, nav color to darker green and add underline. And then I started saying like, you know, well, there's like six greens on this page. What do I do? You know, do I start saying like lighter, brighter green? And then I ended up with this really long, um, really long commit message and I thought I was doing the right thing but if you have you know this whole series of paragraphs for commit messages you can't do anything with that or either um, I saw your hand up a moment ago is you know what uh, if I was that organized I would have added a JIRA ID but you know like a like a JIRA or an issue ID and that would have been a really good thing to do however often when I was working with myself and I was like, oh, let's just fiddle with it. I know what I want to do. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go through, through that process. Um, did, did you have something you want to say as well? That, that is a really good thing to do. So, so the comments that I've been getting are like, hey, Use those issues, use those JIRA tickets, and have those be the descriptive parts and something that someone can click through. And that's absolutely right. How, however, when I was working you know, um, with myself or on a personal project, whether or with myself on a client project, I would kind of like um, head down and not spend the time breaking those out. I would say, I know what I want to do on this nav bar. We'll just sit down and do it. And that was an ugly thing that, you know, there, I was not separating those steps out. And I also realized later that it doesn't make sense to take as many steps after development begins as I was taking. So I would start developing right away and then say, maybe this should all be yellow. You know, and then like colors would change and things would, would um, there would be ma major visual changes. But it makes more sense to take that design process and like pull it out. Um, and do as much of that beforehand as, as possible. So I had a lot to learn. Um, and as far as the commit messages go, um, like I said, I would start and then get more and more specific. And the problems that I had is that, you know, either I felt I wasn't being specific enough or it was um, so long that it was something I couldn't make myself come back to. So what would you do to give yourself a foothold in this whole mess? You know, I hear you about the JIRA tickets. That's a good idea. Um, but like, let's, let's say you hadn't gotten there yet. And you, you know, so I was like, well, I could write better commit messages. Seems like a good idea, except the reality that we saw. 
Um, are there other tools that I could use that would give me clues? Um, one thing I found is within uh, most editors, there is a plugin that will allow you to see the colors. Um, you know, instead of just a hex value, it'll show the hex value in the color that will be displayed. And some of them even have a little UI where if you click on it, you can change that real quickly. But the difficulty was is that wouldn't help me until I pulled down my code and ended up at the right spot. So I was still in this like, you know, time, uh, you know, this, this time struggle. Um, and if anybody else has any other wonderful ideas to throw out at me, that would be fabulous. Um, so at the time I was, you know, I had been, high, it was one of those things where people said, hey, I would like you to make a website for me, and by the way, you'll design it too, right? And so I said, well, if there's money on the table, I'm going to find a way to make that happen. <laughs> Has anybody, you know, taking it on something that's like maybe a little bit too much because they said, well, you know, surely, <laughs> surely we can make this happen. So for me, I had an initial conversation with this person where I found out that they thought yellow, you know, they, they were creating a site that they wanted to, you know, evoke feelings of trustworthiness, hence the color yellow. And they wanted to, um, you know, it was about strength and foundations and like starting uh, life off in a positive way. And I said, okay, so we're doing yellow trees. So we just had like 18 of these yellow trees going on, and um, that was my idea of what a design process might look like. Anybody think that I was totally on the right path and that's how design works all the time? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I had to learn that, you know, if you're just iterating, you're, you're missing the mark entirely. Now, so the other, the other thing I was running into is, so I'm self-taught, and that means that every piece of, you know, when I was, especially as I was getting started, every piece of what I made, I had to go and find a tutorial and like kind of figure out how that piece would work, and then I had to figure out how to like stitch them all together. So this is approximately what I looked like, like 85% of the time when I was trying to get, get something done. And I don't know if there's like an analogous situation in testing where you're like, oh, I would do this, but holy cow, now I need to spend 10 hours figuring out how to do that. Um, but that is, you know, was my, uh, was my day to day. And ultimately the thing that I had not uh, figured out was that design actually has a lot more going on than I ever expected. Um, so here I have this nice, long, super exhausting, non-exhaustive list of things that designers do as part of the, their process to finding um, you know, the solution that is going to be the most you know, intuitive and helpful. And you'll notice that after that initial interview, I ran straight to the bottom of the list. I was like, we're just going to iterate and that's going to be good. We're practicing design. Everybody's going to be super happy. Um, and the and the problem was is, you know, there's, there's some ideas within the developer community and maybe within testing as well that are, they're kind of toxic. They say things like, you know, build it or it didn't happen. And, you know, I, they like under, they um, kind of cut away at the importance of that like foundational research and stops people from asking like, what should we be building? Because if we're just sitting around valuing um, the final product, like coded or if it didn't happen, you know, we're, we're stuck in a position where we aren't going to go back and do all those steps and build things that are really useful to other humans. So we're just going to end up with 45 versions of yellow trees. It turns out that she didn't want a yellow tree at all. <laughs> she's, she's like, nothing you had, nothing you brought is useful. That's like really old fashioned and that's not what we're about. We're a modern site, Veronica. And I was like, trees are modern. And, uh, um, and so I, I had to learn about, um, about the steps that I hadn't taken to, to be able to appreciate them. So you can imagine 
especially if you were coding as you were figuring out what your product should look like, that you would end up going back in time in your Git tree a lot. So I spent most of my day sitting in the sadness puddle with a broken board sitting next to me. And, and that, that was just the position that I was in. Um, and I wanted to find a way out of there. So I started thinking about ways that I, different ways that I could bring myself to the right point in time in my Git workflow. And I was keeping a folder of screenshots to show it to my client, you know, those 85 yellow trees, those were all screenshots. Um, so I was keeping this folder of screenshots and I said, well, I'm keeping these for the client anyway. Why don't I keep extras for myself? So I was creating like this little flip book that I would flip through and I would see like different versions of the site or like small changes. But the difficulty was, is I didn't have them associated with any commit. So I would be like, this is where I want to be. And then I'd go to my, my Git workflow and I'd be like, shoot, I don't know where that is in this like stream. Does that make sense? It hurt. It was really painful. And additionally, you all know about what the, um, everybody has a local, has a folder just on their desktop, right? And it, it always ends up like this. Have you all seen this meme? Um, so yes, when you have the untitled folder of junk, you're not going to find anything in it. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. Um, I, I, so I had a choice. I could either spend time renaming each one of those files and so that I could find them again, or I could start thinking of another solution. I said, there's, there's got to be a better way. Um, so... My next idea, I want to associate these screenshots with these commit messages. So I started saving them into Git. So I would save them as a separate file, and then I would um, put that link within my commit message. I would click on it, and then it would take me to the raw file. And I would say, and I said, oh, this is wonderful. This, <laughs> this is super. I can see what I've done and know I'm going back to the right place before I do that whole scary Git time travel thing. Um, and I felt pretty good about that, but there's still, there's still some painful parts. Does anybody know what those painful parts might be? How was I taking those screenshots? Control, shift, four, different for non-Mac users, but, you know, I was taking those screenshots by hand. I was like, Roop, and then boop, and then I had this, like, screenshot taken at date and time, and so I either had to change, so I had to change that, and then I had to remember to commit it. So there's all these extra steps going into my process. And who wants extra steps in their process? No, no one. <laughs> um, so I started thinking of ways that I could address this. And I did something that many developers avoid doing at all costs. I started talking to other developers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I got out of my, you know, out of my cubicle, out of my home office, and I started saying, hey, I'm having this problem. And a whole bunch of people said, you know, screenshots? You save screenshots? We don't save screenshots. Who saves screenshots? Do y'all save screenshots? Okay, so you all save screenshots, so I'm in the right room. But I was not in the right room a lot of the time, and so a whole lot of people were like, what you're doing is really strange, and that's not what developers do. And if you're like someone who's just getting started and figuring things out when you hear that, you want to crawl under a rug. Um, and then somebody told me, like, oh, it'd be really great if we had that, actually. I'm, you know, because... Folks who are working like at agencies in situations where they worked with the client quickly would wrap up a project and kind of set it aside. They were like, we don't have time for that. What you're doing is weird, and you're weird. And then I would, you know, cry a little to myself. And it, But people who were in situations like me where they would have like longer term relationships with clients where the client would probably come back in a year and say, how about an update? They would, you know, those folks were like, yes, Veronica. Can this happen? Please make it happen. Um, and finally, and those were like the folks who were most accessible to me. And 
And finally, I talked, started talking to folks who worked at larger companies. I talked to folks at eBay. I talked to folks at Google. I looked, on, I looked for um, white papers. And you know, I started, and, and the folks at larger companies said something I absolutely did not expect. It turns out that, save, that like using screenshots is not strange at all. It's just something that the folks that I was working directly with were not doing. So they said, oh, we have that. Um, and they use screenshot diffing. Does any, who here knows stuff about screenshot diffing? Yes? Can I have a show of hands real quick? We're going to do a little like boop. OK, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I left in the slide about what screenshot diffing is. And so we'll, we'll um, go over that real quick. So screenshot diffing is when you have, I use the example of like two nice images of a park because we need a little more nature in our lives. Um, but you have these, these two images, which to our eye look the same, right? Looks like no difference. Um, but there's a filter or there's some sort of modification in there. And there are these regions of difference. Um, and depending on where you're working and what their criteria are, if there is like a certain percentage different, um, that's going to get kicked back. And it's going to be like, and it's going to be like, hey, this new image is not like the old image. Um, so like in this case, what I'm referring to as the old image is called a golden. And that's what you want your front end to look like. That's what you want your site to look like. Um, and so then, you know, programmers do their programming thing and something shows up on the internet and the screenshot happens and the two get compared. And if they're like, even, you know, whatever your threshold is different, it gets kicked back and either it needs to be reworked or you say, never mind, that's actually the new golden, that, that's what we're doing. Does that make sense? Do people feel kind of happy about like what that, what that is doing broadly? Um, so I can't tell you how exciting this was for someone who'd been being told for months that what they were doing is weird and no one cares about screenshots. Um, like to hear like, oh yes, we, we all do this and it's fantastic and it's a big part of our testing. That was exciting. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I want to be really explicit about what I did. I had to like, I had to like get out of my bubble, talk to other human beings and, um, and not be this cat because like no new friends, that sounds pretty bad. Um, and I realized that in this whole process, one difficulty I was having is that I wasn't talking to others, and I certainly, and with all the problems I'd had with design, I wasn't talking to any designers as well. Um, so I went and I found myself to some design folks to talk to, and they had, and I said, hey, how do you do, use this? Do you save screenshots in your version? Like, it, it, like how does this happen? What do you do to make this process simpler? And um, they said something that sounded very familiar to me by then. Um, they said, oh, we have that. And I said, oh, you too? And um, it turns out that designers have their own Git. Like there's literally a Git for design. Um, so uh, abstracts compare mode has, uh, has a, what is approximates a Git right down to the timeline visualization and the commands that they use. And it was really kind of powerful for me to be like struggling to put more visual into my, um, into my dev life. And then to see that, you know, designers had come the other direction and they were like, oh, we, we have, this is like what we work with and we're using tools like developers. Um, so that was, that was pretty amazing. Uh, I skipped this slide. It's important to ask questions. Look how happy that person is. So I got, I got ready to dive into the problem. I said, OK, so I have some pain points. I have the time to take the screenshots, and I want to avoid that. Um, I have to remember to take these screenshots, because otherwise you end up back in that you know, folder of screenshots misery if you choose the wrong one or you forget. Um, and I have to find a way to add a limit image link to my commit message. Um, so. Some of you are going to be familiar with uh, Puppeteer. I use the Python version because that's who I am as a person. Um, but you can, but you use those to uh, to 
do the uh, screenshot diffing. And I was just interested in that first step, that, you know, capturing the screenshots. And then I learned about and used Git hook. And Git hooks will allow you to hook one action to another. I just learned about these at the time, and I so I want to make sure I'm explicit. It's kind of like, you know, if you commit something, and then that commit also causes another action. So I imagine like the Git hook kind of like tapping Puppeteer and being like, hey, it's time, do the thing. Um, and then, you know, I went back and made a terminal prompt to, uh, to save, it's like say, hey, you probably want to save this now, to save by hand. Um, so I would put a commit to git, uh, pipeteer would be called by git hooks, the screenshot would happen, and then I would save. And I lived a very happy life after that. Um, so, you know, I started out as a geologist and there were, you know, I was a geologist and when, when I was getting started, I was making maps and then later did paleomagnetism where like the orientation of the rocks is really important. So the whole time I've been doing very visual work and what was really important for me to figure out is, you know, people had been telling me you need to like drop all the stuff that you used to do and just become super hardcore and know how to code and just like not see anything else. Um, but it wasn't until I was able to use like the intuition and like the ideas that I had like, well, why don't we do this? You know, that I kind of developed in the past that I could make something that was actually useful to people around me instead of like floundering. Um, and so it is pretty important to be able to do that. And I want to encourage you if you're you know, if you want, um, the other thing I ran into is, so when I, when I was going around and asking people, what about screenshots in your version control, would that be good? It was like a 50-50 split. And so it was like really hard, like do I pursue this or not? But I said, look, if 50% of the people are saying this would be amazing, and 50% are saying this would stink and be a waste of your time, it's probably more about, you know, what we value as an industry and less about what's going to help those individual folks. Um, and I did a little research and found out that, you know, about 65% of folks are visual learners. And, you know, if 50-50 are saying, you know, yes, no, and 65% are visual learners, it's, it's totally possible that this is going to be something that helps us, you know, break down some barriers for people who are, like, trying to get started in open source and, you know, entering a new project. Um, so next time somebody says, we don't do that, it might be, it might be time to do a little, little pushback on what they, on what they mean there. Um, so, if you think this is the most exciting thing you've ever heard, I have some resources for you. I learned, um, so there's a, when, as I was researching what, um, tools exist and like say, you know, as I was first getting started, I was hearing about proprietary tools. So within those big companies, they have their own stuff that they use and they aren't going to share it with me. Fine. Um, but you know, as, as, <laughs> as I went out and, um, and saw what else is available, there's a whole bunch of tools that are open source and do different, um, you know, have different takes on using screenshots as a method of documentation. So these, um, and those are there on the, on the right, but often you want to be able to roll your own for whatever reason. Uh, so some of the, some of the uh, pieces that I found um, helpful in my research are there on, on the left, and certainly we have um, plenty of time for questions. I'll just keep saying stuff. Could, could you pop up here? The Git hook that you used, if you use a uh, corporate Git 
to do your manager. Could you put it a little closer I'm to I'm sorry, the Git hook no that problem. you use, is that good? Yeah, it's good. Is it your personal Git hook or is it something that you were at, had to talk with your group, your corporation about how do I set this up? And Certainly. Um, uh, any anyone can use Git hooks. Git hooks. Um, uh, if did did everybody hear that all right? Um, he just wanted to make sure that this was something that everyone had access to and wasn't uh, you know corporate. Um, and uh, yes, every everyone can get you uh, get hooks. I've actually only used them on personal projects, so that's absolutely something that that can be done. Um, what made you want to um, become a developer? You said you changed jobs and you were self-taught. I'm just curious what led you to that. So uh, how much time you got? <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you the short answer. So um, geology is wonderful. And I loved being a scientist. And I was like the happiest clam of a scientist that there ever was going along in sciencing. Um, but it's also can be a very volatile field, uh, partially because so many of the jobs are uh, connected to uh, energy. And you know, when, when the price of gas goes down, it's the sort of industry where they'll drop 35% of their workforce and not give it a second thought. So when you get dropped along with 35% of a, any industry's workforce, and you're told, yeah, we won't be hiring for another nine or 10 months, um, you start thinking of other options. Uh, and I, I had friends who were in development, um, and I had been working, you know, a, as a scientist, developer adjacent for a while, and like using scripts and needing to be able to at least read and understand code. Um, and so at that point, and I, I started hearing from folks who were developers, you know, we would never get treated like that. And I said, yeah, maybe I shouldn't get treated like that. Um, and so that's kind of when I started making that mental shift. Uh, so I spent those, those months sitting on my couch and learning Python and crying a lot. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's how, that's how that, that's how that rolled along. And we can tell a much more comical and longer story at some, po at some point during the break. I confess I got a little lost on the screenshots because I thought you said you were using screenshots and then the developer said they didn't use screenshots, but then they said they did use screenshots. Can you clarify that at all? Sure, sure. Um, so most of the folks I ran in, I, I talked to when I was started contributing to, like when I first started contributing to open source, I asked and said, look, we're working on a dashboard and I only can see the current dashboard unless I go back in time on your version control and open things up. And that's hard for me. Why? Because you're using Ruby. And I'm just learning Ruby because I'm fiddling around and trying to contribute to open source while learning 12 things at one time. And they said, Veronica, it's very strange that you would think we save screenshots because that's not what developers do. And I heard this several times as we were going along. Um, but the thing that was kind of interesting and a turning point for me. And I guess like the, the underlying story here is like surrounding yourself by people who engage in conversations that are a little bit outside of what they do and expect is really helpful and empowering. Like I, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a whole story in itself. Um, but it wasn't until I started talking to people who worked in other environments who were like, within large corporations, and they said, yes, that's part of our testing environment. We do it every day, Veronica, which is much different than developers don't do that. That's strange. Um, so, the, so, the, so what's going on there is people working in different environments do different things. So if you just turn and talk to the person next to you at your company, you'll learn a lot less than if you're you know, going out to conferences and saying, like, hello, friends. You know, I do something strange. Do you do it too? Cool. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether <clears throat> you were using um, the viewport functionality on Puppeteer. So, you're like, are you doing the screenshots just full screen, or are you doing them in different viewports as well? So, uh, the question was, did I use um, just a full? So, 
there are a lot of options in Puppeteer. You can go literally page by page, and every time you do a commit, you, you could set it up so that you take a, you know, you could take a screenshot of every page or every view on your site. I absolutely did not do that. Um, I, I worked, and this is partially like what my workflow was like. I would usually work, uh, break things down so that changes would be like page by page, unless I was doing something to a nav bar that would affect, you know, that was abstracted out and would affect everything. Um, so I did, uh, you know, I, I, I started out with just take me a shot of the whole screen. And, and that's, that's what I did. Um, but there are so many options, and it's a great tool. And if you want an image of every single part of your page at every point, you can do that. I was wondering, uh, how did you solve the manual process of renaming, uploading, all of that, like, Using the Git hook, did you write a script for that, or is it kind of more? Um, did you have it also like maybe go through Puppeteer to check, you know, changes and compare them, and maybe report something back and kick the commit? I'm just curious. I guess your process from going to manual to automated with sure. that whole thing and kind of sure. how you did that. So um, I certainly could have written a script that would, uh, you know. That would um, rename that in some way, even if it was like numerical, just to like get get that uh, date time nonsense out of uh, out of the screenshots. Um, but what I did is I just had like you know I said that's enough automation, thank you. I'm just going to have a terminal that like reminds me the terminal like pop up that reminds me to put that up, and that that's where I stopped because for me that was um, that was enough. But that would be that would be a very good idea. Um, and would get, you know, smooth out the process, that last step. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very painful topic. Um, <laughs> I think we're all on the path to learning how to name our commits. Might have been just uh, get squash all the terrible commits that you make into a reasonably named commit? I ha like to this day, I hesitate to use git squash because I still, um, and this will change with time and as I become more experienced, but I, I still, especially with my personal projects, I still think of each commit as like a small child that needs to be loved and cherished. Um, so, so git squash is sometimes used with hesitation but I see you in your good practices over there, and everyone should use get squash when appropriate. <laughs> oh, we got one more. I'm sorry? Oh, what color was the tree? So um, the problem was not that it was yellow or something like that. The problem was everything about it. Everything about what I was doing was wrong. Because um, I'd made the mistake of being like, oh, we've talked for 25 minutes about this. I see you. And I made, did not take all those other steps. So uh, don't be me and try making 85 yellow trees after an initial conversation. It needs more than that. 